Welcome everyone to Fergo and the Freak. I am your host, the Glorious League Freak, and today we've got a very special de- guest. It's Jessica Dunn. Hey, Jess. Hey, thanks for having me. Now, before we get into our discussion, I want to tell everyone about Manscaped.com. If you go to Manscaped.com and you put in the code NRL, which is our exclusive code, you get 20% off and free shipping of absolutely everything on their website. Uh, Go and get the Perfect Package 3.0. You get absolutely everything in it that you could ever want, and you get it with a 30-day money-back guarantee. So make sure you put in that code NRL. It lets them know that you heard about them through our podcast, and that makes them love us even more. All right, Jessica, you have been commentating on W League games and A League games for SWA Sports, and I wanted to talk to you about your experience in commentary because I did a little bit of commentary for the New South Wales Rugby League in 2019, and I wanted to get a different opinion on what it's like to be a commentator. So first of all, tell us when you knew you wanted to start commentary and how you ended up working for SWA Sports. Completely by accident. It was not something I'd ever really considered. Uh, The lovely Julian Dahl reached out to me on Twitter. Uh, Those of you, he's sort of the brains behind SWA Sports. And uh, I, when I was working at Channel 10, I wrote an article. It was an 800-word satirical rant called No, My Boyfriend Did Not Drag Me to the Footy. (laughs) And it was just, you know, things that had been said to me as a female supporter at the footy. And Julian saw it and reached out and asked if I wanted to uh, come on board for for the A-League and W-League season. And I said no, Mm -hmm. absolutely not. Uh, And then eventually... (laughs) A couple of people at work talked me into it, and I said yes, and it was possibly one of the best things I've done. That's awesome. And so what, what was your first game that you commentated? Uh, it was Wanderers vs. Raw at Bank West. Mm-hmm. It was possibly the most boring game of football I've ever watched yeah. and made me question if I even liked the sport <laughs> anymore. Uh, it, was, it was incredibly dull. And... Then somehow I got a call back for the next week where I was thrown into a Matildas game. Which is absolutely incredible because yes. I just can't even imagine that because the first, I felt like the first time I did commentary and I was doing the, like the color commentary part. Um, yeah. I, I like, I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't really know what to say. And it all goes so quickly that you sort of sit back after you've done it and you think what just happened And then the idea of the next game being an international, I can't imagine how you felt. It was, yeah, I I think I said about two words on the first game. Mm -hmm. I was, it was, and as I said, it it, it sticks out to me because it was such a boring game. So there wasn't too much to talk about because Mm -hmm. they weren't doing much. There was, you know, not much positional play or anything like that. So I was sort of really scrambling and I'm sure you can relate. You learn very quickly that what you say at home on the couch uh, sometimes isn't quite radio appropriate. Oh yeah, one hundred percent. So I was like, oh no, I can't, ha- I can't say that. Uh, so yeah, it was. I, I don't think I breathed for ninety minutes. It's just <laughs> a mess of nerves. <laughs> and I can imagine, like in in rugby league, and there was one game, and I can't, <clears throat> I can't remember who was playing, where we commentated it, and it was just a bludger of a match. But rugby league has different things that you can kind of, you know, draw upon and and talk about. I mean, you can even feed into conversations about the NRL from the New South Wales Rugby League. When you're watching an A-League game and it's a soccer game, and and I still call it soccer because I grew up with it being called soccer, and I love soccer. I grew up with with an English father. (laughs) Okay, so you called it football. So, like, but it's weird because people will be like, oh, you can't call it soccer, and it's like, but I called I called it soccer when I was a little boy and I loved yeah. it. Like, what are you talking about? Um, yeah. Anyway, so it, it, in a in a soccer game, there's because there's like it, I just can't imagine when it's a bad game. What do you talk about? Uh, you you sort of talk about past games a lot, or mm-hmm. um, other games from that weekend, mm-hmm. or. Uh, particularly for last season for the Wanderers, obviously because we're a Sydney based radio station just talked about how, how diabolical they were. Yeah. Uh, 
yeah, but it can be really difficult. Sort of, uh, you know, you're desperate when you're previewing, you know, matches two rounds ahead. <laughs> like, yeah. already looking that far forward. Yeah, yeah. Now, tell me your experience of going to Bank West Stadium as a commentator, because for me, it is one of the funnest things I've ever done. It's a it's been a brand new, beautiful stadium. It was just like it's. It's hard Look, to I did, I did, I did my first couple of calls at Bankwest Stadium, and you're sort of ruined for everywhere else. Yeah, yeah. You, you, the rooms are so large, and they're like most games are catered, and there's aircon, and there's not aircon up at Central Coast, mm-hmm. um, and you know you really feel that, and it was the summer sport. So yeah, it's just, and I mean the view. I mean Bankwest is such a brilliant stadium, mm-hmm. and the fact, you know, the commentary boxes are on halfway at the perfect height. You can just see everything. You can see all the fans. It really is a a special place and a special place to call. It really is. And like, even the, the behind the scenes areas are really, really nice. They, it reminds me of a little bit of like a a nice hotel behind the scenes. The the, the escalators and the glass. And yeah. Yeah. And, and the, like, I, I remember when the new South Wales cup, uh, final was on there and like they had coffee on they had a coffee room and I was like this is fantastic my first game was at Blacktown um, I can't even remember the name of the little stadium and it was just basically a glass box at the end of the stand and I thought that was awesome and then going to Bank West Stadium where it is just like just luxury and it really does it spoils you because you're you you want that experience every single time from then on in. Yeah, exactly. So you go to other stadiums and you're like, this is this is what's this? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like the the only other one for me that really stood out was uh, I called a game at Penrith Footy Stadium, and that was just because I'm a Panthers fan, and it was like, oh man, yeah. I'm I'm behind the scenes of Panthers. That's great. That was. Um, that was me and I'm a Newcastle Knights fan. And so yeah. we went up and did Jets games and yeah, that was really special for me walking, uh, walking in there. And do you know, in my head, I still feel like it's a new stadium. Um, yeah. And I got into the media room and realized it was not a new stadium anymore. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that was, that was slightly disappointing. Yeah. Uh, it's like, it's always like, you know, never meet your heroes. It was a bit like that, but yeah, uh, yeah that was pretty special to be in a, a media box uh, up at Mac Jones. So have you had an experience where, and obviously it being A-League, you're at pretty good stadiums. Even the worst ones are pretty good. Um, have you ever had an experience where you've got to a facility and you're like, oh, man, this is actually pretty dire? No. Oh, the, I wouldn't say it was the worst. It was just the sh- sort of strange. During the lockdown, the after, sorry, when we came back after the COVID break, Mm-hmm. Uh, at Cogra, because of the limited numbers, we weren't in media boxes. We were in uh, the like private suites, which yep. were leveled down, and so we were on the same concourse as the fans. All right. And uh, we obviously had our effects mic outside, picking up the crowd noise. Except it picked up the crowd noise immediately in front of us. Yeah. Uh, and it was a rainy. It was. It was. Uh, I think it was. It was Western United and. I think Western Sydney Wanderers were playing Mm -hmm. and it was the most miserable night you could imagine. Uh, And like the door kept rattling because it was just, it was was obviously on the water and the rain and the wind. And (laughs) it was just, I miss our media box. (laughs) (laughs) You know, the, the funny thing about Cogra, I remember when I first went there and it was to call the New South Wales Cup, but never been there for an NRL game. And the thing that got me was like, there's no parking. You just park yes. in front of someone's house and it's like, and I'm going when there's a few thousand people there and I'm thinking, how do they get 15,000 people it, in here? Honestly, uh, yeah, that was uh, one good thing about COVID restrictions was that there was parking. <laughs> I I have a park like 15 minutes walk away. Yeah. Um, there's this little little um, playground area in in some houses and I just go directly there. I don't even bother fighting for somewhere to park there. Yeah, yeah it's just, or you park in the school. All right. Yeah, there's a school you can get parking in. Okay. See, I didn't know that. I ended up parking, like, 
yeah, in front of someone's house about mm-hmm. three streets away. It, t- it took about 15 minutes to walk to the stadium. It must um, be a nightmare for people who live there. It must be like, it's not, yeah. how, like Leichhardt as well must be like that. Well, I've heard Leichhardt's. I've never been to Leichhardt myself, but I've heard that Leichhardt's the worst. It's, I went, I've only been there for an A-League game during COVID regulations and mm-hmm. It was I, – I don't understand how they – where people go when that sells out. I honestly yeah. don't. <laughs> yeah. It's funny. It, like, the other one that got me was uh, Belmore. Have you ever been to Belmore? No, but I know the area. <laughs> yeah, it's – like, that's another one. Yeah. yeah. They've got this tiny little car park, and luckily enough, it worked out all right because of the game I went to, there wasn't many people there, but – um like, like it's just so bad, yeah, the facilities. It's, like, parking. Give us parking. It's one of those things. That it's the price you pay for a local stadium like that because I love those stadiums. I think they're brilliant and we should use them more. But, yeah, yeah it's the parking. <laughs> I remember there was an article me and Andrew talked about once where somebody said that they should have tailgating in the NRL <laughs> and it would be great. And it's, we were joking. It's like, there's no parking. Where do you do this tailgate? <laughs> Where do you do that anywhere? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's so weird. Um, so yeah, so how many, like, and it's, it's difficult to go back and know how many games you've done, but yeah, like how, how long have you been commentating for now? Uh, so I started at the end of 2019, it was about Mm -hmm. November, I, I joined the team and I was on pretty much one game a week, Mm -hmm. uh, until the end of the season, which ended up being, um, oh goodness, when did it end? June? I think uh, Oh no, it was much later than that. Yeah, it went longer, didn't it? Yeah, because it oh. went well into winter. It was like August, yeah. September, I think it ended. Uh, yeah, I I was on for at the end that because the A League season obviously was um, as every other sport was stopped. Um, it was quite a rush of games at the end, mm-hmm. and because they were all in Sydney, we we tried to get to as many as we could. So yeah. yeah. Covered and it was we do Sydney based games, um, some at Central Coast and some at Newcastle. So usually I was at one of those places at least once a week. Now, see, that's interesting because I found for me I needed breaks every so often, um, but you didn't. I I but I think by the time I was like, well, maybe I'd like a weekend off. The COVID break hit. Okay. Um. So then. I had I had a forced break and then I was ready to go again. I was just so, wanted to get back into it. So and then just saw the season out. Now, do you do you see yourself because we talked about this a little bit before the podcast? There's not too many avenues for women to become commentators and like not just sideline voices or anything like that, but actual game commentators. And you're one of the few ones. I've ever actually seen, which is, it's, it's <laughs> it, not, it's, it's terrible. Like, um, and with Swa Sports League, we had talked about getting women into the commentary box and giving them an avenue to, you know, start somewhere. And you're, you were telling me you eventually want to get into the league side of it as well. Um, like what avenues have you ever found for women wanting to commentate games? I, because it was never something I'd thought about previously before Julian got in touch, mm-hmm. um, I hadn't really like looked into it that much. But once I got into it and sort of met other people who do commentating for other things, I was really quite surprised. At, there are, there are chances out there. Mm-hmm. And coming from a football um, point of view, you know, the state leagues, you don't have to be calling top flights. Yeah. Uh, you know, the NPL has NPL TV, which is the state uh, soccer leagues. And, you know, they have on their YouTube and they have callers um, for all their games. So I think it's just a matter of getting out there and networking. Yeah. That's the big thing. And don't don't be afraid because I was, as I said, I was very much like, no, I don't want to do it. Um, and I just, you know, took a risk and ended up loving it and have met people who have introduced me to more opportunities. Yeah, I was lucky enough to be friends with Daniel Pettigrew and, you know, he, he basically runs the SWA league team and had known him for years and years. We actually did some 
um, commentary that we would call games that we were watching off TVs online, like in the early 2000s. So, and then he went on to do commentary properly and he nagged me to do the commentary for years. And that's the way I got into it. Otherwise, I wouldn't have even known the first place to look to start commentary. And it's something I hadn't really thought about doing. But then once I got the podcast going and stuff like that, it just seemed like the natural thing to do. Yeah. And as weird as it is to say, you know, Twitter is just such a brilliant place to meet people. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I always say there's only th- in Australia, there's three types of people on Twitter, journalists, sports fans, and racists. Um, <laughs> That's really, <laughs> That's so true. Yeah. Um, I'm only two of those. Uh, <laughs> and if you combine your sort of sports fans and, and uh, journalists, you know, mm-hmm. and you, you just meet people and Twitter's a very odd place in that respect. Yeah. And, you know, opportunities just come along and you just got to take them. Yeah, yeah, it it is very cool. Um, Like, I remember in the early days of Twitter, it was interesting that all the barriers were broken down between people. And so, like, like I I remember reading Rugby League Week Mole in Rugby League Week magazine, (laughs) and then all of a sudden, like, I was just able to message him and say, hey, do you want to come on the podcast? And he was like, yeah, "Yeah, let's do it. And the barriers just are all broken down. It's fantastic. It's great. I've met, you know, I've met some um, fun people on Twitter, you know, who, you know, we all share the same, same passion and we just sort of love the game and, and just have fun. Yeah. Yeah. It's great. Now tell me about a little bit about the A-League because the (laughs) A-League was kicked off with a lot of fanfare and it seemed like it was it seemed like it was going really well. They got rid of a lot of the old problems that they were trying to distance themselves from. And then it just seems like the momentum for the competition is just starting to wane a little bit. It, yeah, it's and uh, I'm not going to name anything, but, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of um, issues with how the game's treated by broadcasters. Mm hmm. Um, and media, unfortunately, it's just, you know, if A-League does get a mention, it's something negative. Mm-hmm. And it's a shame because this season has just been, it's been such a brilliant start to the season. You know, the games have been, you know, genuine nail biters. Mm-hmm. And the Mariners, who have been perennial wooden spooners, uh, are on top of the table and they're just, you know, playing great footy and, and it's, yeah, it's such a shame that it's not getting uh, the, the attention that it deserves, especially this season. And the fact that it's not getting attention just um, worsens the, the, I guess, the state it's in, in terms of how it is in people's psyche. Yeah, and it's like when they brought in the MacArthur team, and I thought, wow, this is going to be really good, for especially in Sydney. I thought it would really give it a bit of a kick along. And it, it just... Like, I was shocked to see that MacArthur had started playing games. There wasn't a big build-up sure. to, like, the kickoff of this MacArthur team because it's honestly one of the most important teams in the whole competition because of the the base that it's drawn upon. And I, I was really shocked that there wasn't this massive build-up for it. it. Look, up until three months ago, I think a lot of people were questioning if MacArthur was even going to be able to field a team. It just... Oh, yeah. Like as in as in exactly what you were saying, there was no fanfare. There wasn't, um, I think you know, it's like oh, we've signed a coach, and then there was wasn't really much else um, released about it. And yeah, there wasn't any information. And fans, I guess, they were drawing on they're drawing on the the Wanderers fans fan base. Yeah. Um, and unfortunately for the Wanderers, they were the reason why Macarthur started this year was it was to give the chance for the Wanderers to settle into Bankwest. It was their first season in Bankwest and sort of build that back up as a fortress. It didn't go that way for the Wanderers. They were, they weren't great. They didn't play good football that you would pay money to watch. And so it really was a chance for MacArthur to come out firing and be, you know, look at us with the new boys on the block. We're going to be amazing. And it just, they didn't do that. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And it's, uh, and the other thing too is like MacArthur, obviously it, it's a, a place, but like then you get the 
the new Melbourne team, which is Western Union, and it's just a weird name. It's yeah, uh, it's it's not a location. It's two adjectives, Western and United. That doesn't tell me anything. And they don't yeah. play in West Melbourne. They play in Geelong. It, do they really? <laughs> because they're still waiting for their stadium to be built, but, oh. but no one knows when that's happening. So they're currently out at like somewhere in Geelong, I think. <laughs> That's ridiculous. And they're playing on an A-League ground. And watching a rectangle sport on a circle field is possibly the worst thing. It's rotten. It's so rotten. I don't think people understand how – I think that that's held rugby league back in the past where it's like, you know, the fan experience is terrible, especially for – for soccer where you want to be like really close to behind the goalposts if you're a crazy fan and (laughs) you just can't, you can't be there. Any, I'm sorry. Anybody who says they want the NRL grand final SCG at the SCG. No. Yeah. I agree. Absolutely not. Yeah. It's a tradition is a load of rubbish because the ground is terrible to watch. Yeah. ANZ stadium is possibly the worst stadium in the world. Yeah. I would still rather the the grand final there. (laughs) Yeah. 100%. 100%. I was so disappointed when they didn't do the massive upgrade to ANZ and make it a rectangular oh, oval I know. Uh, stadium. I think they will eventually, but they, it, it was hard to justify it when everyone was coming down with COVID. Yeah, yeah. It was one so, of those things. You know. And and also, we sort of need it for the uh, 2023 Women's World Cup. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's going to be interesting. What, what do you think about that? Like, how, Do you think that that's going to – obviously, it's going to have a, a big impact for women's – uh, football, but do you think that that will give just the game overall a bit of a kick along? Because I, it needs something, doesn't it? It does, and uh, it's not the it's not the FFA anymore. It's the FA Football Australia. Mm-hmm. They they need to use it because in 2015 Australia had the um, AFC Championship, which Australia won. They won it on home soil. Yeah, um, you know they were champions of Asia, and. If any, the, if anything, the game has gotten, or the perception of the game has gotten worse since then. Mm-hmm. That was sort of the peak of football. Um, the A League was at, the A League and everything was in 2015 with that win, and they didn't cash in on that success and that hype. That was on home soil. It wasn't just Australia had won their first trophy. It was on home soil. Yeah. And you know, the Matildas, who uh, I don't know if you know True North, it's a, a research. Uh, company and they do into sport and every year every sorry every quarter they do a survey on which team uh, fans have the most emotional connection to Matilda's mm-hmm. top that nine times out of ten oh, the wow. only reason they didn't top it um, during one of the quarters last year because they were overtaken by the women's cricket team because they just won the t20 world cup yeah so the Matilda's have you ever been to a Matilda's game no I haven't no it's 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 such a different demographic to a to a men's game. Yeah. And as with all women's football, because it's it's families and it's young girls and it's young girls who are looking at players on the pitch who look just like them. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I've, I've always said I'm not I'm, I don't want to, you know, pontificate. But, you know, when I was younger, it was the, the boys played football and the girls were the cheerleaders. Mm-hmm. And so you hope that these girls are going to grow up and and see their heroes who look just like them in the biggest competition in the world mm-hmm. at, you know, their local stadium, you know, the Matildas or, you know, are going to be at ANZ stadium 15 minutes down the road from us, you know, that's mental. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I guess the thing is too, like I, I look at the women's rugby league and I like, I really, really enjoy watching the women's rugby league. They play really hard footy. It's brutal. It, it's, it's crazy. <laughs> It's absolutely know, crazy. I don't know if it's because like the hair goes flying more than in the men's and it just makes every hit look harder. <laughs> I just go, ow. Like, and I've, I've attended uh, international games, the women's international games before, but uh, n- not everyone is built to play women's rugby league. Mm-hmm. And so you get like a game like women's soccer. And, the, you know, that's something that if you're not built in a certain way, you can say, well, like I can represent Australia in in soccer and you know there's so many more nations you get to play as well it's it's cool that it's going to be on our soil exactly and the Matildas there was unfortunately for the W League there was a bit of an exodus last year Uh, a lot of our top players went to Europe yeah did they go was the did the um, England start 
really treating women. Yeah, yeah, they've really women. sort of taken um, taking it more seriously. We had obviously Sam Kerr went to Chelsea on a million pound deal, mm-hmm. uh, which is just like brilliant for the women's game. Uh, mm-hmm. We've got Hayley Russell at Everton. We've got quite a few at Arsenal. Um, we're sort of taking over Arsenal at the moment. Uh, but most, more importantly, we've got Ellie Carpenter at Olympic Lyon. And in women's football, they're untouchable. Yeah. They're, they've been European champions seven years in a row now. Oh, wow. Yeah, they're completely un- That's and crazy. We've, we've got an Aussie, and she's, you know, early 20s. We've got an Aussie in that team. Yeah. So that, that's only good. And having – one of the things that's always held the Matildas back is we haven't had much European experience because the teams we usually play are the USA, Brazil, Chile, and Japan. Yeah. And so we get to a World Cup and we come up against the European team and we don't really know what we're doing. Now we have all our best players over in Europe. So they can only benefit the Matildas. And and that's something that I know the men's team suffered with at times where there was a understanding within the Australian game where it's like, we have to go out and play more South American teams mm-hmm. and not just the ones like that play hard, that we need to play the Brazils. We yep. need to see, to a certain extent, how far behind we are. Um, and so in it was a similar thing in the women's game, but it was Europe was the problem, was it? Yeah, Europe Europe was always our sort of, I, I guess, bogey team or area. Mm-hmm. Um, whenever we were in, you know, the World Cup, that was where we always faltered, just because we didn't have much playing time against them. Yeah. That's interesting. And, you know, the... When I saw that the women's players were leaving to go and play in Europe, it reminded me a little bit of uh, with the Women's Basketball League. And it, it reached a real height at one point in Australia. And then the WNBA started and all of the best players left. Yeah. And real, it like just cut the heart and soul out of the game to a certain extent here where we had like a legitimate one of the best leagues in the world. And now it's it's really a development league for the WNBA. Yeah, there's uh, the good. The Matildas is quite. There's quite a few young players. We have the young Matildas as well, who we're getting to see in the W League. Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, there's there's such a talent pool that the W League. I don't think it's really suffered in terms of quality. Mm-hmm. It's just sort of yeah, the names people, the names that people recognise. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know who you'd go, you you'd know, you'd be like, oh, you know, there's four Matildas on this pitch today. Unfortunately, that's not there. So you know, you 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 win some, you lose some. It's it's maybe not been great for the W League, but hopefully in the long run, particularly with a home World Cup, um, we'll get the, we'll get some benefit. Fingers crossed. Yeah. Now, let's change tact. We'll go to rugby league. You said you're a Knights <laughs> supporter. Um, I, I like condolences. Thank you. Support. It look, it wasn't a choice. <laughs> yeah. Um, it was family obligation. Mm-hmm. Um, so I didn't really have much say in it. And unfortunately for me, the first few years of my life were great. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's just been like, just when you think it couldn't get worse, the nights just find a way. Yeah. And they like, it's not that long ago. They were one of the statistically worst teams of all time. I think Fox Sports named them the worst team of the 2010s at the end of the decade. Yeah. Yeah, they were. <laughs> they were. Definitely. It was, yeah, it was, it was like, well, you know, you'd get wooden, you get, the wooden spoon, you think, well, it can't get any worse. It's like, oh, oh no, <laughs> yes, it can. You can get it three times in a row. <laughs> <laughs> so h- how do you think that the Knights are going to go this year? Because they've had some stuff going on in the off season. Then, you know, I, I, I don't know. How, I don't personally know how to rate them because going into at the end of last year, I thought, you know what? They're not bad, but they feel like they're a few players away from being really a worry for the premiership contenders. And then in the off season, it feels like they just imploded a little bit. I really want to go back to November when I was really excited for the season to start. (laughs) Yeah. Because it was, you know, we had, I know every team has their injuries problems, but <laughs> um, I think we were playing about our ninth choice hooker by the end yeah. of the season, poor Phoenix yeah. Crossland. Yeah. Uh, and it was just like, you know, I was really excited for the new season. We'd have um, all of our players back. Uh, we'd have a good off season together. We had, a, we've got, we had Tyson Frizzell coming in. Um, 
I was I was really excited and then like they've just I, yeah yeah <laughs> the, the, the weird thing for me is that like through the whole off season there's been this little rumor that and it's you know it's probably the least of his worries at the moment that Mitchell Pierce is not going to start this year with the Knights that he might move clubs and it's been consistently there which is kind of weird and then it's kind of gone into the background with all the other problems that he's had but it, it's not the best way to be looking towards a season that your halfback might not be there or even it's just rumored that he might not be there yeah it's a year ago Mitchell Pierce could do no wrong in Newcastle Mm. Um, in terms of like the townspeople mm-hmm. and Newcastle such a, a rugby league town you know they really if if they love a player they will protect them with everything and obviously things have gone terribly wrong yeah in the last couple of months and I think that feeling has really left about Mitchell Pierce because yeah. you know Newcastle media doesn't have much to cover so that's pretty much all they covered um and he yeah wow he really has to put in some good performances to start the season, hopefully consistent, consistently, but yeah, to start the season, he really has to show that um, I think he's still, his heart's still in it for the Knights. Yeah, he needs to come out and make people start talk about his footy again. Yeah. And that's the only way he can, he can I, fix that. I think the the pressure sort of got to him last year because our spine was just decimated mm-hmm. um, every position about three times. And it, he was sort of him and him and Ponga, were all the create the create uh, creativity in the team, mm-hmm. and they both really floundered. Now, tell me what you think about Ponga because I, when I watch him play, I think he is absolutely amazing. I, I'm in that camp of like, if he has the right players around him, he can take the Knights to a premiership. But then there's some people that think he's overrated. And uh, so what camp are you in and what do you think of him as a player? I, I, I'm still in camp uh, brilliant mm-hmm. because I need to be for my own mental health. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I think what what's special about Ponga is because Knights just had such that awful run when, and he came in and he was a breath of fresh air in the team. Mm-hmm. And he was, he was the first, probably one of the first signings in a while that the Knights got right. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And whenever he touches the ball, the crowd, you can feel the crowd swell. Even if he's got the ball for two seconds, you can, the, it just gets a little bit louder in the stadium. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I really hope as long as uh, teams don't work him out, I think it was the Cowboys last season mm-hmm. when I think we, we were up in Townsville and it was a game we got. We were decimated by the Cowboys, mm. and uh, the Cowboys uh, kicked it along the ground to him every time. They didn't let him get a high ball because that's when he's really dangerous. When he gets that chance to, you know, build up speed. Yeah. And so they took that. He took. They took Ponger out of the game, and Knight really suffered for it. So I think as long as he can, teams don't work him out, and he can sort of stay ahead of them in that regard. He will. He will. Fingers crossed for us because he's just signed what was it, a four million dollar deal. Um, he will he will be a club legend. Now, who's your favourite Knights player of all time, and who's your current favourite Knights player? Uh, Danny Badiris. Mm-hmm. I'm Camp Danny Badiris. Uh, I I once when I was six years old, I had about half a dozen goldfish, and this was just after the 2001 Grand Final. Mm-hmm. So I named them after you know my favourite players. I had John Z and Badiris and Robbie O'Davis, Tamana Tahu, Matt Gidley, and uh, they all died within like a month. Oh jeez! And I'm pretty sure I cursed the night. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm pretty sure that was it. It was me. I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, David is my favorite nice player at the moment. Apart from, look, I want to say Jack Johns just because I'm so happy there's a Johns in a Knights jersey again. Yeah. Um, but uh, Kalen Ponga or Tex yeah. Hoy, just because I'm really excited about Tex Hoy. Ah, yeah. Why are you excited about Tex Hoy? I just, he was just exciting for me, and I think he was he he just he played in every position on the park last season, filling in. And I will 
sorry to bring up bad memories, but the game, the the first game back after the COVID break uh, against Penrith, mm-hmm. um, where we had, was it an ACL, a meniscus and an HIA in the first 20 minutes? Yeah. Um, <laughs> and Tex Hoy came on, it was like his first game and he was, he was just brilliant. He just looked comfortable at yeah. that level. He yeah, just yeah. looked comfortable and he didn't look um, overawed by the occasion. And you you always felt something special was going to happen with the ball when he had it. Uh, he'll, he should get a, a bit of game time, particularly at the beginning of the season because Pong is still out with his shoulder. Mm-hmm. So I'm sort of hoping for his sake and my sake that uh, he can really show us what he's made of and hopefully find somewhere in the team he can fit because he's just one of those players that can sort of play anywhere in sort of that back line. It, it's weird how, like, you think through the Knights team and you think, okay, who who would I like to have a big year? And every single player that you basically could name, it always ends with, like, hopefully he gets over that injury. <laughs> you know, because I think of Bradford Best, you know, and, and I'm like, oh. he, like he's, he could be a, a test player. You know, yes. he's got that potential. He's 18. Who looks like that at 18? <laughs> no, I thought it was just me. No. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, he like he really could be yes. a, a test player. And it's funny because when uh, the Bulldogs signed Kotrick, and they signed him for a lot of money, and I remember thinking, man, I would rather have Bradford Best and, and pay him that sort of money because I feel as though his ceiling is much higher. Yes. And But then it's the thing of, like, as long as he stays healthy. And that's a problem the Knights have really had for a while now. Yeah, it was um, – yeah, last year was incredible. It, and, like, even we brought in, like, McCulloch um, from the Broncos, mm. injured. And then we brought Blake Green in, which I'm very excited we've signed him um, for the year. Uh, he played, what was it, two and a half games? And yeah. – I don't know if it was because Newcastle fans were just so desperate because our season was slipping away and we just needed someone to sort of make up numbers at that point. Mm-hmm. Uh, Blake Green was sort of our last gasp at um, that. and But he just played brilliantly and the fans sort of took to him immediately and it was really quite devastating when he did his ACL. Mm. So, he, yeah, he's another one that I'm um, – he's, he's a nifty little player. Um, hopefully he can he hopefully he can calm Mitchell Pierce down and relax him. <laughs> Something take, needs to happen there. Yeah, yeah, sort of take the pressure off in terms of that creativity and yeah. give us another fifth tack, uh, fifth tackle option. Yeah, and, and it you know they needed that they needed another point of attack that wasn't Pierce or, kicking or to the player. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it really was because I I felt like Ponga he was the one that would take over when the game was on the line, the playmaking duties, because Pierce yeah. would go missing a little bit. Mm-hmm. And it's uh, they needed more than that because, as you just said earlier, if you got to that point and you shut down Ponga, the, the Knights stopped. They just completely stopped. And, yeah. and you know, they they need to be aiming higher than that. Um, h- how do you think they'll go? Do you reckon that they'll be able to make the finals? Like, I feel as though they're one of those these teams where – it, their finals chances are really going to come down to how they finish the season. And th- I think they'll be close to the finals bubble, but it, it's going to be how the fi- they finish the season. And the problem for the Knights is but by the end of most seasons, they're, you know, they look like a triage centre. It's terrible. John, John Hunter gets a lot of business from the Knights, let me tell you. Yeah, they really do. The Knights have this incredible ability uh, to win a game – 40 nil and then get smashed by 60 the next week. Mm -hmm. And you just, you just look at, sometimes look at the performances and think, how is this the same team? Yeah. And they they might get a a win against a team they're not supposed to, and then lose against the Broncos a week later. Like, (laughs) and yeah, it's just consistency. And I think if we don't make the finals, just consistency would make me happy at this point. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. I just want to know that, you know, they're on the right track. What was an improvement for most of last season, bar a few exceptions, uh, was they finally had some fight about them. Yeah. Because, you know, the, the I mean, the team I mentioned earlier, especially that 2001 team, that but that generation of Knights, 
they were all, they didn't give up until the last minute, the last second. Mm -hmm. And that's what Knights fans just really want. We just want a team that even if they have to grind it out at the end, don't give up where the last, in the last 10 years, the Knights have just rolled over. Yeah. And, it, you know, one of the good things that you saw last year, especially early on in the year, was that the forward pack started yeah. to look like it, it, you know, had a bit of backbone about it and yeah. started to take it to teams. And I've always felt like when the Knights are at their best, it's always off the back of their forwards. They've been, look, they were blessed with Andrew Johns, but the Knights before Andrew Johns, uh, were always known as a team that even when they were bad, their forward pack was going to make you play. <laughs> Would you run against against Paul Harrigan? <laughs> <laughs> no, definitely not. Yeah, look, I can I, like, I can still name that 2001 team. I was six years old and, like, you know, you yeah. start with the forwards, Matt Parsons, Steve um, – oh, God, now I've forgotten. Not Steve Smith. Simpson. Thank you. That was yeah. bad. <laughs> Steve, <laughs> Steve Simpson. You know, and I – you know, my vivid memories of them is just – you know, the legs pumping. They'll have five five guys hanging off them and the legs pumping. And well, how about the, the grand final that Ben Kennedy played? Oh. And he should have been Clive Churchill medalist. <laughs> like no doubt about it. And uh yeah. And Billy Billy Peden, you know, yeah. out of hooker. Uh you just yeah, you you look back on those teams and I think that's probably half the Knights fans problem is we're a little bit nostalgic for those days and we just haven't had the team to really back that up. You know, I'm going to be perfectly honest with you. There was, you know, four or five years there where there was such a turnover in the team and mm -hmm. the team, the, the players didn't do much that was notice, noticeable, memorable, mm -hmm. that I couldn't tell you who was playing in 2012. Yeah. Yeah. Like I, I knew it was bad for the Knights when, and I can't even remember the dude's name, but they had a winger and he was all right, but he was like, he was their best player. You are and, fair. No, no, it wasn't was Uate. It? it was after him. Oh, what was his name? We had we had um, Dan Gagai for a while. Yeah. Um, who just used us as a training room for Queensland? Yeah. <laughs> well, and uh, like the Wayne Bennett period of time mm -hmm. was weird. Like, look, I, th I didn't. We had Brian Smith. Yeah. Which, like, I didn't think it could get weirder. <laughs> <laughs> We had we had a, a billionaire who wasn't a billionaire own the club for a while. Like I thought that was the, that was it. It could only get better. And then yeah, Wayne Bennett. Yeah, that that was such a weird time. Like they sell the club to a billionaire who. And th there's a real problem when you don't actually have the cash. It's all in the ground. And then uh, and then Wayne Bennett brings together this team, and it's like they have this crazy one-off season. And then the following year, they all become immediately old. Yes. <laughs> like, that was a problem. And, and yeah, it just got worse from there. Yeah. I, unfortunately, like, I, I live in Sydney and the two-hour trip to Newcastle doesn't phase me to watch a game. Mm -hmm. I love it. I love Newcastle, God's country. Uh, but it sort of just became a chore and I just didn't enjoy it. And I, I have to I hate to admit it, but I stopped going because yeah. – four hours on the road for a $50 ticket to just watch the absolute trash for 80 minutes. Yeah. It's like, I've got better things to do with my money. Yeah. And not only that, you're going up, up and down the M1, which is yeah. like taking your life into your hands sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Particularly don't, avoid uh, Tugger to Doyle, Doyleson at the moment. <laughs> oh man. It's like, I hate driving in that part of Sydney. I don't mind driving in any part of Sydney, but once you start going up north that way, to, yeah. through, uh, it's, it's like, it's just horrible. Um, okay, so what about the overall NRL season? Like, have you got a team that you think will be favourites um, and why Why is it the Penrith Panthers? <coughs> Sorry. <laughs> I mean, they're not, it's not a bad shout. They're, they're going to be close, gonna... but, you know. I don't know how they're going to back up. Yeah. I think South Sydney are looking pretty good. Mm -hmm. They are, yeah. I think, and um, Latrell Mitchell, if he can have a blinder, he can really make a difference. Yeah, and, and having Benji Marshall too as yeah. a backup if their halves go get injured, which they've, you know, they have done from time to time coming into the finals, that for me is massive. Um, 
you know, and uh, Jai Arrow as well being yeah. an addition in the forward pack. I agree with you. I think that, that it, it leaps them up towards, I think it's the Panthers, uh, the Storm, obviously, because, you know, they're always in there. When, and, when are the Storm going to stop being good? Because, like, every season it's like, surely this has to be the season where the Storm just capitulate. And every yeah. season they prove us wrong. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's the thing, like, like – Oh, they're, they're gonna, they're losing Israel Folau. They're gonna, not gonna be as good. They're losing Greg English. <laughs> yeah. They're not being as good. I remember back towards like, oh, they're losing Brett Kamali. Who's, who's <laughs> gonna play half back now? They're stuffed. So I, I just, until they, until they let me down, I'm gonna have complete faith in them. Yeah. Because it's... if you just get, had complete blind faith for the last 20 years in a storm, you'd be sweet. You'd be sitting pretty. Yeah, and sorry, Melbourne, but it's the least deserving NRL city in the country. Oh, and they shit. have the best team. <laughs> <laughs> you don't deserve it. <laughs> wow, that's interesting. Are they the least deserving <laughs> city to have a team? Oh, man. What I about... The of worms there. <laughs> what a, yeah. What about Manly? Well, what? how long how long is Tommy Trevojevic going to be uh, running down the course, though? I know. How cool was that scene doing that? <laughs> if I was a footy player, I'd be taking, like, running running uh, contests with randoms as well. <laughs> yeah, I, I I feel sorry for the poor bloke. He's, yeah. he's probably the one person in the game where he says he did it in the shower um, and not during this race, his hamstring. Yeah. He's probably the one player in the competition i actually would believe <laughs> yeah well he yeah he's ma- he's made a biscuit let's yeah. face it right <laughs> and yeah like I, I just i can't even imagine getting in a situation in the shower where i pull a hammy <laughs> how weak are your hammies you're an elite athlete <laughs> yeah yeah it's a weird one and i love the way that the media today was just frothing over it yeah. They're so like, he said he did it in the shower, but look at this vision of him running. It's like, yeah, he should be able to run. He's a friggin' NRL footballer. Even like the NRL physio on Twitter got involved. Yeah. It was so yeah. weird. It was, a, it was a weird day in NRL land today. It, it really was. It's, it's Rugby league is, it, there's very few sports in the whole world where there can just be a day where it can be, you can be like, you know what, by the end of this day, there's going to be a dude that falls over in the shower. It's going to be a dude that does something to a poodle you won't believe. It's going to, like, it just, you could go down the yeah. list, you know. Man doesn't know how to use re urinal. Um, yeah. <laughs> I always, I always find it so amazing. NRL, like the NRL, for us essentially, is it's not even a country's game. It is along the East Coast. It is yeah. purely East Coast, yet we, it still manages to garner a complete news cycle. Yeah. You know, you have football, for instance, where it's a worldwide sport. Still doesn't garner the same amount of headlines that the NRL manages to do. Yeah. And like, you, I mean, you, as you say, you've got this worldwide sport where it, like you could you could line up the weirdest day in <laughs> all of worldwide soccer versus the weirdest day in rugby league. It's not even close. Rugby yeah. league is just like, hold my beer. Honestly, it's just... It, it's one of those things, like, it, it's funny to laugh about, but at the same time, it's like, guys, come on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it really is. It's uh, so many times where rugby league is one of the few sports where someone can say, hey, have you seen that so-and-so did this? And you're like, what? <laughs> yeah. Is, is that really even a thing? <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's it's incredible. We love it, though. <laughs> yeah, it's it's great. It's great. Um. With the calling of rugby league games, you haven't called a rugby league game yet, have you? No. What What is something that you're looking forward to calling a rugby league game? Like, is it just, uh, I, like, I don't know, there's, there's different things. Like, is it just being able to see the development of young players? Is it just being able to use, like, player nicknames that you might know? <laughs> like, what is it that you're looking uh, to? Two things. I'd love to ch- – I think it would be a really big challenge for me because uh, in as much as I'd love – it's a test of my knowledge in mm-hmm. terms of the game because mm-hmm. um, that's what I found with, like, my football calling. It was like, okay, do I understand the game as well as I think I do? Yeah. And, um, you know, and I guess feeling the pride from that and whatnot – 
go into the local grounds. I yeah. love local grounds. Mm-hmm. And I'm really excited. Well, I was really excited to hopefully I do get a chance in the future um, to, you know, go or to go to the local grounds and, you know, eat the terrible food and, <laughs> um, you know, sit on the sideline because they don't have a media box and like all that. That that brings me happiness. Yeah. Bring four coats because it's the middle of winter and, you know, sit in the rain. It, it's I haven't yet called a game outside of a box yet i i know that there was a point where i was told like we might be calling it desks on the sideline and i was like that's not what that's not what i signed up for yeah i during during the covid break we went out and did um like local league games yeah and just because for something to do and whatnot and it was fun it was the blacktown league and yeah we were literally a table on the sideline and it was the middle of winter um, I drastically underestimated the temperature drop when it got dark and I had just yeah. a denim jacket on. It's like June and I was so cold, yeah. uh, um, but like loved it. Yeah. I, I, you know, I guess it's something you've got to experience. I feel like it's one of those things like afterwards you love it though. Yeah. In the moment it can be a little terrifying and yeah. you're thinking, what am I doing here? Mm. Um, but yeah, when you sort of sign off at the end and you take the headphones off, it's a thing like, oh, that was fun. Especially if it's a close game. Yeah. And you know, those games that get you yelling and out of your seat, those are, those are just so much fun. You don't get them very often. Yeah. They're pretty special. And it's, uh, like sometimes it goes really, really quickly and you just wish that there was another game following it up because yeah. you just want more of it. Cause it's so much fun. Yeah. And we were talking about this before the the podcast to be part of the show. Like when you turn up and you feel like you're part of the whole production of what's going to happen today. Yeah. It's a really cool feeling. It is. And it's, it's, and obviously not many people get to experience that. And I guess it doesn't matter sort of what level um, you're on in terms of like, uh, I guess, you know, obviously we're not Fox or nine, but you just, yeah, you just feel part of the show and, you know, to sit in that box and to just have a really unique view and uh, experience of the game. Mm. It, it's it's amazing. It really is. It's um, and a test you, as you say, like I know when I was doing it, I was like, I didn't know. I didn't go in with the plan. I was just going to see what happened. And the one thing that I kind of found myself going towards was um, talking about like the feel of the game and uh you know being just just how much you know the game you know there's yeah. there's a difference between and I'm not good with the player names I'll be the first to admit that but <laughs> knowing knowing football that's something I do know and it was cool to be able to use that uh in real time yeah. it, that that is awesome and, and there's also something about being live which is like electric as well <laughs> It's slightly terrifying, but um, once you get over that, I think also, um, and I mean, you've worked with the Swire Boys, you know, I've, we have a really good team um, mm-hmm. for the football and we just have we just have a lot of fun and, you know, the banter that goes on and that kind of thing as well. Yeah, it's uh, like every single person that I worked with and, and look, it must have been uh, close to a dozen people eventually. Like everyone was cool. Everyone was yeah. just happy and everyone loved footy and it was there was no rubbish going on at all it was just like oh yeah you know it's cool to see you. and yeah everyone wanted everyone to just have fun and be happy it was one of the really cool aspects about it yeah you know I go in with absolutely no ego and mm. so you and I think they do as well and you this exactly you're just there because you all just love the game you just want to have fun with it I, although I have to say, when we start calling again, I'm going in with all the ego. I, <laughs> You're I, a veteran I, now. You're going in. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I've done like, <laughs> I've done three quarters of a season now. I'm good to go. <laughs> oh, mate, as I said, my second game was a Matildas game. I'm like, yeah, I call the Matildas now. Sorry, what's this, A-League? <laughs> I'm so jealous of that. I want to be, I want to call one of the, uh, the Gillaroos games. Oh, yeah. That'd be so cool to do that. Yeah. 
there's a, there's just something something special about an international game. And we got as awful as this said, especially because at the time we didn't know how much the world was going to change. But the Olympic qualifiers for the women's football were supposed to be in China in I think it was February. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the breakout had just happened in Wu- or was going on in Wuhan, and Australia scrambled, and we ended up getting the three the four games and six mm-hmm. games. And um, so just by awful luck, uh, we got the Matildas games and I got to call Australia and China, you know, when we qualified for the Olympics. Mm-hmm. So that was pretty cool. That's awesome. So, so yep. we like, you know, you know, I was there when not only was I there, but I called that game when we qualified. That's amazing. Yeah, they really had to work hard to make that oh, happen. They, yeah, they made it difficult for themselves. Yeah, um, but in saying that, poor China, they they because they were training near Wuhan, the province, mm. so they had they had to come and they had to quarantine and you know, bless them, they they probably deserved it, <laughs> deserved yeah. the win. <laughs> it's crazy because like, I, I reckon two or three months after that, there's no way they would have let them come from so close to Wuhan. Uh, well, they Australia wouldn't have hosted it. Yeah. Uh, and as well, that hosting those games, the fact that Australia could put on, and it was essentially a mini tournament mm-hmm. uh, with two weeks' notice, and we got fans in the stadium. And, you know, for the amount of preparation they had, it was very well done. Yeah. Uh, really helped, I think, with our World Cup bid, particularly for uh, votes from the a- our Asian neighbours. Well, when the Women's World Cup turns up, if you need any an assistant, <laughs> like anything like that, like I'll go and get the coffees. I know that, uh, oh, man, I remember once I, at Penrith Footy Stadium, I turned up to call a game and I thought, you know what, I'll get everyone donuts. I'll go over to the donut thing. I would have had to have spent 100 bucks on donuts. No one got donuts that day. But I'll go and get donuts or anything like that you need if I can just turn up to the final and just be in the box in the background, you know. Yeah. Yeah. It's one of those, it's, it's kind of crazy to think that, you know, if everything goes as we hope, we'll, we'll be there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Man, that would be so cool. Like, yeah, uh, that, who, who would you like to see in the final? Who would you like to see Australia play? I'd like, I'd like to see Australia play um, the USA and win. Oh um, yeah. That's just, right. The US just, is good. Yeah. They're the best team of one, you know, back to back world cups. Mm-hmm. Uh, Oh, maybe, maybe like a Japan Mm -hmm. um, because they're like our closest rivals in terms of, I guess, um, like level Mm -hmm. Um, and or Brazil because we have a lot of good battles with Brazil. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't know who else is really powerful. I don't want to say England um, because my, my loyalties lie with England, like half. Okay. Um, I have I support Australia in every single sport except men's football. Okay. Um, where I support England. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I I would feel really sad if England lost a World Cup to Australia. <laughs> <laughs> it would be weird. I'd be half happy, half sad. Yeah. Um, so I don't want to say England for that reason, but I'll take an Australia or an England win. Okay. I hope that Australia faces like some nation that. They haven't even got TV to watch the games. Well, like, do, you, do you know what one of the, the best things about this Australia and New Zealand getting the World Cup mm. is that New Zealand get uh, automatic entrance into the competition, mm-hmm. which leaves a spot open for a Pacific nation to make a World Cup. Ah, okay. Like Fiji, um, you know, or a Tonga has a chance to yeah. be in a World Cup and they'll be like the first Pacific nation other than New Zealand to do so. And that is just so brilliant. Yeah, that is interesting. Wow. Yeah, because like I, I know when we changed confederations, New Zealand become the top dog in Oceania. and New but, Zealand is the only team to never lose a match at a World Cup. Oh, really? Well, because when they're in South Africa, they drew all their games. They've only been to like one World Cup and they drew all three games. Oh, there you go. See, <laughs> so they've didn't... never lost a game. <laughs> they've got the best record of the, of the World Cup. I don't like that at all. <laughs> we need to get them back in the World yeah. Cup and put them in the group of death. Yeah. Here's 
Germany, Brazil, and France. Have fun. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Good luck. <laughs> Let's see how the record looks after that. <laughs> We've probably just cursed Australia, you know yeah. that. Yeah, that's exactly who we're getting. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, thank you so much for coming on. It's been awesome talking to you. Where can people find you online? Uh, my Twitter is at Jessica Tenille. One word, uh, Jessica, and then Tenille is T-E-N-E-A-L. Mm-hmm. Uh, and yeah, I'm on Twitter and I'm usually tweeting sarcastic comments about whatever sport I happen to be watching at the time. Yeah. And, uh, everyone should give you a follow cause, uh, you're good to follow. Yeah. It's interesting to see <laughs> it. You know, what is really cool about following you is you, you comment on things that are not in my sphere of like I even know what they are. So it's just, it's good to get a different perspective. On I, something I always like. love it when, if I go on a bit of a tweeting spree during a certain thing, I might get, you know, some followers who obviously are really into that thing. And I'm like, welcome to my brain because in two days I'm going to be tweeting about a completely different sport in a completely different country. So welcome. Yeah. Yeah. Look, I, I know what that's like. I, I've got, I, I've got this weird, tweet that i didn't even do i'm just mentioned in and i'll tell you about it after the podcast <laughs> and i keep on getting just it's weird anyway <laughs> so thank you for coming on um we'll get you on again sometime soon how about that sounds good look forward excellent. to it already excellent so everyone if you can go and follow jessica and then go on to manscape.com and put in the code NRL, 20% off and free shipping, everything on the website. As I've said, get a perfect package 3.0. You get absolutely everything in it. It's a great gift if you want to give it to somebody as well. And, of course, you get that 30-day money-back guarantee, but you won't need it because you're going to love absolutely everything, and you're going to get in touch with us at the podcast and say, this is the greatest gift you've given to all of your listeners. I swear to God, that's what you're going to say. So thank you once again, Jessica. Thanks for Uh, having me. It's been a blast. It really has been. (laughs) And thank you to everyone that's listened. We'll talk to you again soon.